On a battlefield that witnessed the first mass use of tanks in 1917 and heralded a new type of warfare, we follow the lads from the West Riding of Yorkshire through a village past Nornate Chateau to their memorial. Under the shadow of Havering Corps Wood, we find solace in a comrade cemetery where we ponder, does one name somehow speak for them all? The Battle of Combray in November and December of 1917 is seen by many people as the first tank battle in history. But tanks had been first used on the Somme in September of 1916 in the Battle of Fleurs Corselette. And what Combray was, was the first mass use of tanks, the first clear demonstration, really, of what tanks were capable of doing. But it wasn't just a battle about tanks, as we'll discover during this walk, as we walk some of the ground connected with the 1917 battle close to the village of Haveringcourt. But the tanks used in this battle were parts of the Tank Corps, which had only been in existence since July of 1917, having been formed under a raw warrant. Prior to that, they'd been part of the Machine Gun Corps, and the formation of the Tank Corps almost coincided with their use at the Third Battle of Ypres, the Battle of Passchendaele, as it's commonly known, in the summer of 1917, the wettest summer in living memory, when the grounds, as well as shell fire, saturated the battlefields around Ypres, and the weather, combined with that shelling, turned the whole area into this vast quagmire, conditions not at all suitable for the use of tanks. And the tanks that were employed there got bogged down, some got stuck in moving up towards the uh, the battle area, and in the open and exposed ground they became prey to shell fire. And there was an area close to the Menin Road near Hoog that became known as the Tank Cemetery because there were so many wrecks of tanks from that period of the fighting. This failure of the tanks in the Third Battle of Ypres and some of the, the trials and tribulations that they'd had with them in the battles of Arras and then at Messines, for many senior officers there was a thought of almost sidelining the tanks. But they were given essentially another chance with Combray, an opportunity to demonstrate what tanks could do in grounds of their choosing, favourable ground. And the Combray sector was chosen for this battle because it was in stark contrast to the conditions at Ypres. This was rolling chalk down land similar to the Somme. It was an area that the German army had withdrawn to during the retreat to the Hindenburg Line in the spring of 1917. And it was an area where there had been no serious fighting. Trenches had been dug, both sides had occupied the line, there had been shelling in the day-to-day -day activities of trench warfare, but there were no pitched battles here. So the ground was not saturated with craters, was not churned up in the way that other battlefields were, and it offered an opportunity to prove what the use of tanks in cooperation with all of the other arms of service of the British Expeditionary Force could do. And for this battle, nearly 400 of the new Mark IV tanks were brought up and used. But as I say, it wasn't just a battle about tanks. By 1917, the units of the British Expeditionary Force, whether they be British, Australian, Canadian, New Zealand, South African, they were part of what was becoming a modern army, an army that was evolving. It was moving on from the pitch battles of the early period of the war, and refining and developing its approach to fighting on the ground. And this was not just with the implementation of new weapons like tanks, but the change in the approach to the use of infantry in cooperation with other parts of the army, like tanks, but also more importantly with artillery. Artillery throughout the First World War was both the king and queen of the battlefield. Most men were killed or wounded by artillery fire in the Great War, not bayonets, not machine guns. And the use and development of artillery and artillery tactics in the Great War by the British, and by British I mean the whole of the BEF, including all Commonwealth forces, was really part of our key to, to victory uh, in the final year of the war. And Combray marked a, a turning point in this really because it was the first battle in which the artillery launched a bombardment that did not need to pre-register its targets – 
So artillery would have to drop shells on a target to register the guns for fire and obviously alerting the enemy that you were interested in a particular area that was about to be shelled. This battle, the shells were dropped on target in the opening bombardment and that combined with the greater use of sound ranging and also the use of mapping, the clever use of mapping and aerial photography meant that the artillery simply were far more accurate, far more deadly than they'd previously been. So on the opening day of the battle, the 20th of November 1917, on the fronts where the British Army advanced at Combray, generally it was a success. Some of the tanks had been lost either by ditching on the battlefield or being knocked out by enemy artillery fire. Not every objective had been taken on the first day. Ball on Woods, which General Haig had said was one of the keys to victory in the battle, was still in German hands. And the overall point of this operation was to demonstrate what tanks could do in cooperation with the rest of the army, break through the German Hindenburg line here around Combray and advance beyond that into Combray itself, which was a key railhead for the German army and it would cut off their ability to reinforce this part of the front. So it was a bold plan. Combray would not be reached, in fact would not be taken, until October of 1918. And the battle, although successful in those early stages, turned into a slogging match, in particular at places like Bourlon Wood. By the end of it, the Germans counterattacked. They took, in many places, the British completely by surprise with this, and pushed the advances that had been gained back not just to our start line, but in some cases beyond our start line. So the outcome of the battle was nowhere near as decisive as had been predicted at the very beginning. And it cost the British Army 75,681 casualties, according to the British official history, and the Germans lost 54,720. And because it was a battle that very much focused on the use of those tanks, the loss wasn't just in human lives, the loss was in tanks as well. Tanks had been knocked out and destroyed, but a large number had ditched or had broken down on the battlefield and had not been recovered. So when the German counter-attack came in in December of 1917 and retook all the ground that the British had captured and pushed us right back, they also captured a large number of British Mark IV tanks. Now the Germans did not have a tank force at this time, so they were able to use these captured tanks to create their own tank force, while their own tank, the A7V, was still in the process of being developed and would be used the following year. So many of these Mark IV tanks captured at Combray in 1917 were used against the British in the March Offensive of 1918 or in the Battle of the Lys, and also against the French in the fighting along the Chemin des Dames and around Reims in the Champagne. And outside Fort La Pompelle at Reims, for example, uh, the Germans had used a number of these tanks there. And like the tank cemetery at Ypres, which had become a, a tourist attraction in the 1920s, the wrecks of British tanks reused by the Germans were also a tourist attraction outside Fort La Pompelle in the Champagne battlefields near Reims at the same time. So that's a, a little bit of background to where we are in our walk this week. And we'll head now out onto the battlefields just in front of the village of Haverincourt, close to Haverincourt Wood. We're starting our walk on a road, the D15, that runs from the village of Trescolt through one of the fingers of Haverincourt Wood that runs in a roughly northeastern direction towards the high ground and roughly in the direction of, of Combray itself. The road bends through the wood and as it comes out of the trees it gets to a point where you can see the village of Haverincourt just ahead of you. And on the left there is an old electrical substation, a brick structure where you can stop and have a good vista of this part of, of where the attack went in. The village of Haverincourt ahead of us had been a village largely unaffected by the war it had been behind the German lines for the first few years of the war. There had been some fighting not far away at Combray at the beginning, but it had not really seen much evidence of that. German troops had been billeted here, and as we'll discover, there was a headquarters in, in Havering Corps. But when the German withdrawal to the Hindenburg line took place during the winter of 1916-17, the Germans, having realised that although the British had not necessarily broken through on the Somme front, 
that they would be left holding a defensive line that would be impossible to defend indefinitely. So rather than attempt to try and do that, they would withdraw to pre-prepared defences. So this area around Havrincourt became the area selected for these defences and during that winter of 1916-17, German troops conscripted French labour and large numbers of Russian prisoners of war from the Eastern Front were working on the trenches and the bunkers and the barbed wire and all the other features of the Hindenburg Line that ran through this area. And when it was complete, the Germans withdrew to it. The British followed through. Our positions were dug in front of the Hindenburg Line. And in this sector, from that time, from the early spring of 1917 until the Battle of Combray here in November, this was a quiet sector of the Western Front where there was no major activity. The village of Havrincourt sat in a little bit of a salience in the Hindenburg Line. The main German Hindenburg Line defences came down from the north, from the Bapaume Combray Road, and turned in a sort of a dog leg turn around the village itself. So coming from the north, swinging around the base of the village, and then roughly going across to the east, creating this salient. The western side of the village was dominated, protected in some respects, by the Canal du Nord, a canal which is, is there to this day, now a fully operational canal, but in 1914 and, and by the Battle of Combray in 1917, it was an incomplete canal. It had not been finished before the war, so it was dry. So in many respects, it offered another layer of defences to this area because it presented a huge obstacle for any potential British advance, particularly with tanks, this deep and wide ditch. And just to the west of Havrincourt was a particularly deep cutting that when you go over it today and you look down, it is a little bit mind-boggling to see how deep that is. Now that was dry, there was no water in it, but it was this huge ditch, this huge cutting that presented really a, quite a formidable obstacle in its own right. The British positions in front of Havering Corps that were constructed following the advance to the Hindenburg Line, so as the Germans withdrew to it, we followed up. And, and when we got to places like this, obviously they'd not dug a set of trenches for us to simply take over. We had to build our own infrastructure here all over again. And that infrastructure was constructed in the ground where we're standing now. It was dominated, certainly behind our frontline positions, by this big mass of Havering Corps wood. And it gave us a degree of shelter to move men up through the wood. And when the tanks were used here in 1917 to move the tanks up through the wood unseen by the Germans to the start positions. Uh, behind that, behind the wood itself, were a number of villages that formed part of the infrastructure behind our front line. Rualcour, Neuville and uh, Metz. And, and these were the staging posts for British units coming up to the front line, the locations of where the artillery batteries were, were dug in and the medical facilities and so on. The far tips of the wood, these little fingers that sort of reach out towards the high ground beyond Havrincor on the Fleskia Ridge, they were where the British positions ran into the German positions and so bits of the wood were occupied by uh, both sides. So it was quite a confusing little area here. And of course, it being an area where there'd been no serious fighting, much of the trees, much of the undergrowth, and, and much of the buildings here were pretty much intact. This was not the crater zone of Ypres. This is not the devastated ground of the Somme. It was areas damaged by shell fire, but not completely destroyed. So where we're standing now is very close to the British front line on the 20th of November 1917, the first day of the Battle of Combray. And this was an area where the men of the 62nd West Riding Division made their attack. Now we're going to talk about them a little bit more because we'll see their divisional memorial later on in this walk. They had two of their three infantry brigades in the attack here. Now you remember an infantry brigade has four infantry battalions in it. Um, so there were two of these brigades, one on the left was the 187 Brigade and the one on the right was the 185th Brigade and what this translated to in, in actual regiments of the British Army were battalions of the King's Own Yorkshire Line Infantry and the York and Lancaster Regiment on the left and on the right battalions of the Duke of Wellington's the West Riding Regiment going into the attack there, both of them supported by G Battalion of the Tank Corps with their Mark IV tanks. So standing where we are next to this old electrical substation, 
Uh, we've got quite a good view here towards the village of Haveringcourt. Over to our right, we can see part of that long finger of the wood that reached out towards the German positions. Ahead of us is a wooded area just close to the road, and we can see some of the buildings of the outskirts of the village of Haveringcourt. And we're looking straight towards the German front line Hindenburg line positions there we've got some rising ground across to our left where we can see uh, the ground where the King's Own Yorkshire line infantry went into to their attack later supported by the York and Lanx and then beyond that just beyond the trees we can see on the skyline there that is where the Canal du Nord is located that big deep canal cutting on the far side of Haveringcourt village. The Duke of Wellington's battalions that we mentioned, they were in the attack over to our right in the, the wooded area that we can't really see from here. But the open ground we can see ahead of us leading up towards the village and over to our left towards the Canal du Nord. This is where the 2nd, 4th and the 2nd, 5th King's Own Yorkshire Line Infantry, supported by tanks which arrived late for the attack here, broke through the German Hindenburg Line. Then the 2nd, 4th and the 2nd, 5th York and Lanx then continued with the advance along the Canal du Nord, keeping the canal on their left until that could be bridged, which it later was, and units could be brought over from, from that western direction. By the end of the day, the village of Haveringcourt had been taken. There'd been quite a fight here up against the German regiment that defended this, but the men of this division had broken through the village here, pushed on through their next phase of objectives right up to the Bapome cambrai Road, which they'd reached by the end of the day. Ahead of them was Borlon Woods, a wood that they would later be involved in the fighting and the approaches to that, as were many units in the Battle of Combray in 1917. But generally, their attack here had been a successful one. All of the units that had been involved in the fighting across this ground that we can see, whether it was the King's Own Yorkshire Line Infantry or the York and Lanx, they'd all lost casualties, they'd all suffered uh, losses in the, the assaults here. But this was not like the experience of their previous battle at Arras in the fighting at Bullecourt in April and May of 1917 when the men from these units had suffered horrendous casualties in trying to break through the Hindenburg line there. This for them was a, a very, very different battle and the units that took part in this attack had been made up with conscripts being sent out to the front to replace the losses of these territorial battalions, many of which were pretty much intact in terms of their original recruits, in some cases dating right back to the very beginning of the war. So the division sort of really mirrored the experience of the British Army at this time, increasingly becoming a conscript army. We'll leave the start line now and we'll head down the road, the D-15, and continue into the village of Haveringcourt, where we'll meet the major road junction and go around to our right, and stand outside the gates of the chateau, run right in the centre of the village. Standing outside the gates of Haveringcourt Chateau and looking down the drive, we can see that this is an impressive building. It is a private home, it's not open to the public. And in the years that I lived in France, um, the first weekend of September every year, uh, was the weekend of the Journée de Patrimony, uh, which was a, a weekend in which places like this, which were private homes but were buildings of historic importance, were often opened up to the public. Unfortunately, this one, to my knowledge, that, that's never happened, and I've never had an opportunity to go in there, uh, and I don't think that visitors are welcome. So we're not going to step through the gates and go in. We have to respect the fact that this is someone's home, someone's property. But we'll stand here and we'll, and we'll look at this impressive building. The original chateau dated from the 17th century and was made up of five adjoining buildings with extensive grounds, which also included the area that the British knew as Haveringcourt Wood. It was built by the Kodovac family and in 1914 the War of Movement swept through this part of northern France and there was fighting near Combray but not really either in the chateau or around the chateau or even around this village it really passed it by. But the Germans, of course, arrived and, and occupied the whole area and began to control it. The civilians who lived in villages like this behind the German lines were able to continue with their lives, but big buildings like this were often taken over, and the Germans indeed requisitioned Haveringcourt Chateau, and it became a staff headquarters in 1916 during the Battle of the Somme. 
and the whole village became a billeting area in that year in particular for units that had been involved in the Somme fighting and came back here for rest. By 1917, as we've already discussed, this became part of the Hindenburg Line. There was no attempt to demolish the chateau um, or to cut down buildings to create additional fields of fire. The chateau really became part of the bastion that the whole village was within this area of the Hindenburg Line. On the 20th of November 1917, the, the first day of the Battle of Cambrai, the village and the chateau was defended by the 84th Regiment and there was heavy fighting in and around the structure involving tanks that came up to assist the infantry in, in this particular area, be just beyond the chateau, largely battalions of the Duke of Wellington's regiment, the West Riding Regiment. Now, as I mentioned, Havrincourt village and indeed the chateau was in pretty good condition on the first day of the Battle of Cambrai. There was obviously artillery fire dropped onto it, there was extensive damage done to the structure, but it wasn't raised to the grounds uh, in 1917 in, in the same way that troops that fought here had seen that happen to villages and locations on the Somme or at Passchendaele. This village survived, continued to survive intact, right through much of the battles of 1918, but by the end of the war, the punishment of bombardments on so many occasions in 1917 and on several occasions in 1918 reduced villages, reduced chateaus like this almost to dust. And this became part of that devastated region of France that was slowly and steadily rebuilt in the early 1920s, and the chateau was rebuilt in its original style. In the Second World War, I've read that Hermann Goering spent at least one night in the chateau following the capture of this ground again by German units a generation later in the summer of 1940 in the fall of France. It is said that Goering wanted to stay in the chateau because he'd flown over it as a pilot in the Great War. He certainly had been involved in the combats in the air above the battlefields of Combray at that time. But like many of the stories relating to some of the hierarchy of Nazi Germany, one will probably never know whether this is true or not. But uh, today it remains that impressive building here in the heart of the village and part of the rich history and culture of buildings like this right across this region of France. We'll continue round the corner now and follow the road round to where it bends again. And on that bend we'll go off to our right into a, a little square in front of the town hall, in front of the Marie. And here we'll find the local war memorial standing there right in the middle of this little square. Now I find French war memorials fascinating for all sorts of reasons. And this one is one of my favourites. It depicts a, a French poilu, French soldier, in winter garb. He's wearing some sort of sheepskin jerkin. But it's not his attire that interests me. It's his attitude. He's standing there with his hands on his hips in a really defiant pose, typical of that French defiance during the four years of the Great War, defiance in stopping the German army and defeating the German army and throwing it out of mainland France. But I think as well, reflective of part of a, of a greater national attitude of defiance, sometimes we, we poke fun at the French and I often say to people when we come here that he looks like a, a French waiter serving an Englishman who's just asked for a well-done steak. But we've got to remember the great sacrifice that France made in the Great War in this defiance against the Germans, occupying for most of the four years of the Great War the majority of the Western Fronts. So when we look at the 450 miles of the front, most of it was held by the French for a big proportion of the conflict. So that defiance was there, but it as ever, it came at a cost, that terrible cost of 1.4 million dead. And we see that reflected in war memorials like this right across France. Here, the small village of Havrincourt lost 27 men in the Great War. And when we scan our eyes down the list of names, we see several men with the same surname, giving us an insight into the costs that French families suffered in the same way that many British and Commonwealth families suffered. So we'll continue past the War Memorial now. We'll follow a minor road at the far end of this little square, follow it round the corner to our next stop at the Memorial to the 62nd West Riding Division. We often mention divisions on the podcast and perhaps some people switch off at that point. 
but they are an important part of our understanding of how the battles of the Great War were fought. And they're also a way of connecting together the story. They're all part of that huge jigsaw that the First World War is, of connecting all the pieces. Because the army fought its battles based around the implementation and use of divisions on the battlefield. And a division, you'll recall, was around about 20,000 men, comprised of three infantry brigades, each one of those four infantry battalions up until 1918 when that was reduced to three. So most divisions up until that point fought with 12 infantry battalions, a pioneer battalion, then men from the Royal Engineers to supply field companies or signal companies uh, to do the engineering tasks on the battlefield, Royal Field Artillery to supply the artillery supports when on the ground when fighting your battles, Army Service Corps units to do the resupply, Army Veterinary Corps units to look after the horses, and then a whole multitude of, of other smaller units that were all part of the infrastructure of the division to keep it going, to keep it moving, to keep it fighting. When the war broke out, there were six regular Army infantry divisions that were on home station, home service in Britain, that would form part of the initial British Expeditionary Force. There were battalions of British regiments in the far-flung corners of the British Empire that were then brought home, and several new regular infantry divisions were created. At the same time, Kitchener's army was formed, and a whole series of new divisions were created for the massive influx of volunteers into the battalions of regiments of the British Army right across Great Britain. And also, on the outbreak of war, were the territorial divisions made up of battalions of the territorial force, infantry battalions plus all their support in the same way as a normal infantry division, but made up of territorial engineers, territorial gunners, territorial medics and so on. And they were then formed into infantry divisions of the territorial force and dispatched overseas at various stages in the conflict. The territorial force was also expanded during the war with an influx of new volunteers. So what were called second-line territorial divisions and battalions were then formed. And the 62nd West Riding Division, whose memorial we're looking at now, is an example of that. The original West Riding Division was the 49th, formed within Yorkshire in the years before the Great War from battalions of Yorkshire regiments that were part of the territorial force. With the influx of volunteers and men not just joining the new army but wanting to join these local territorial battalions, these second line units were then created. So the 62nd West Riding Division was in many respects a duplication of the original one with the same composition of different regiments and battalions um, but made up of new recruits rather than existing territorial soldiers. So without going into too much detail, one of its brigades was made up of battalions of the West Yorkshire Regiment, another brigade which had fought on the far side of Havrincourt Chateau on the first day of the Battle of Combray was made up, you recall, of the men from the Duke of Wellington's, the West Riding Regiment, and the one that had fought alongside the Canal du Nord coming up through the village was the one that was made up of battalions of the King's Own Yorkshire Light Infantry and the York and Lanx. Now, it's a, it's a unit that particularly interests me because living here in South Yorkshire, there are two local battalions that were part of this, this division, the 2nd, 4th and the 2nd, 5th York and Lancaster Regiment. 2nd, 4th was the, the Hallamshire Battalion, uh, recruited around Sheffield, and the 2nd, 5th was f recruited in Barnsley and Rotherham. And they were made up of men from this area, many of them miners, who stepped forward to join these battalions because the original local territorial battalion was now full. In the case of Barnsley, the Barnsley Powers filled up pretty quickly and this gave them an outlet to come and join and take part and do their bit to serve uh, in the Great War. All of these units then came together into what was the 2nd West Riding Division, eventually the 62nd West Riding Division, and its commander that took it to France was Major General Braithwaite, who again is a character that, that interests me greatly. His son, Val Braithwaite, was a regular officer in the Somerset Line Infantry and fought at Plug Street Woods during the winter of 1914-15, where he was awarded the Military Cross. He then accompanied his father to Gallipoli, um, where his father was a staff officer in the Gallipoli campaign of 1915, and then Major General Braithwaite was given command of this division. Uh, 
His young son Val Braithwaite went back to his battalion, the 1st Somersets, and he was killed on the first day of the Battle of the Somme in 1916. When Braithwaite Sr. brought this division to France, their first tour of duty was in the northern end of the Somme front in front of the village of Serre in that cold winter of 1916-17 when the temperatures dropped to minus 25 up in the front line area. But the general didn't just stay back in his headquarters, he came up to see how the men were getting on and, and more importantly for him, he came up to see the ground where his division was holding the line which coincidentally was the same place where his son had been killed on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. So he came up there regularly to try and search that ground to try and find the body of his son who'd been posted missing. He never found him. His name was eventually inscribed on the Thiepval Memorial to the Missing. But Major General Braithwaite purchased the ground on which his son had died and erected a memorial to him which is still there alongside Sarah Road No. 2 Cemetery in many respects a, a touching and, and moving memorial to one father's dedication to commemorate, to remember and mourn the loss of his son in the Great War. Braithwaite continued with his connections to the West Riding units because he unveiled quite a few memorials across that region of Yorkshire in the post-war period. So he was the original commander and, and the unit, as I say, came over in that winter of 1916-17 It served on the Somme fronts, then following the German withdrawal to the Hindenburg line, it then took part in the Battle of Arras in April and May of 1917, where it suffered heavy losses in the attacks on Bullecourt. It then held the line for a little while. It didn't take part in the Third Battle of Ypres. It built up the battalions that had suffered those losses at Bullecourt, and its next battle was here at Havrincourt and later in the fighting around Bourlon Wood during the Battle of Cambrai. In 1918, it took parts in many of the operations on the Western Front where the Germans broke through, and it was one of the British formations that fought alongside the French in the Second Battle of the Marne in the summer of 1918. In that late summer into autumn of 1918, it found itself back on the Hindenburg line again, back, in fact, on the very same ground back here at Havrincourt. And in that final battle across this ground at that time, it fought over much of the same positions, the same trenches, the rubble of Havrincourt village as it had done the previous year. So going back to a question that we discussed when we went to Polygon Wood in a previous podcast, you know, how did these divisions choose where to site their memorial? Would it be the first place they went into battle, the most successful place they went into battle, or what? And in this case, I think Havrincourt was chosen because for them history had happened in the same place twice. They'd fought here successfully in 1917 and again successfully in 1918 when a new division, not just with battalions from the West Riding of Yorkshire, for example, the 2nd 20th London Regiment was serving in this division by that stage. They were the Blackheath and Woolwich Battalion and they'd been in France, Salonika and Palestine up until this point. So the whole composition of the division changed and again mirrored the, the change of the British Army at that time. But it fought here at Havrincourt twice successfully, so that's, I'm sure, why the division chose, the old Comrades Association of the division chose this site to build its memorial. And as you'll see as we stand here, it's a tall column, and I'll put some pictures of it on the uh, Old Frontline website, oldfrontline.co.uk. Unveiled in 1922, it records on its panels the, the details of the division, and you'll also see a pelican on here as well, because... Every division of the British Army had its own symbol, its own insignia, and this division had the pelican. It was chosen by Major General Braithwaite for reasons that are not entirely clear and was quickly nicknamed the duck uh, by the men. Um, If you look at it, it's got one foot slightly raised, and it was said that when the duck puts its foot down, the war will be over. Uh, That was a a famous saying within the, the men of the division. And I'd guess this is not a a frequently visited divisional memorial, in fact, a division that probably very few are that familiar with. But divisions like this, because they were territorial divisions, recruited initially in specific locations, so had a strong local connection, a strong local bonding, if you like. They often had very good old comrades associations after the war. 
And with that, there's often a, a direct correlation between the erection of a memorial like this on the battlefields and also the publication of a divisional history. So there is a two-volume history of the 62nd West Riding Division. So all of these things somehow are connected. Before we leave here, though, we'll just look at the wall opposite the memorial. Now, Havering Corps, as I've mentioned, was by the end of the war completely destroyed, but one or two structures remained, and there's some bits of the original wall of whatever building was here before the conflicts directly opposite this memorial and it gives us a bit of an insight into the difference in the type of brickwork on the structures that were here at that time compared to what was made post-war uh, and they are in many respects little survivors of the great war things that uh, if only bricks could talk uh, what stories would they tell looking over this ground where there'd been so much fighting in 1917 but from here we'll continue along the little track follow it up to a junction and then follow the cemetery signs off to our right and that'll take us round to Grand Ravine Cemetery. We're very much off the beaten track here. This is very much an isolated cemetery here on the Combray battlefields. And to get here we've followed a, a track which I would never recommend driving down because it's a pretty rough track especially in the winter and the last time I visited this cemetery which was not that long before lockdown uh, back in the early part of 2020 there was not only snow on the ground there'd been a lot of rain um, and there was a huge amount of mud and flooding here and it was a very very difficult bit of ground to try and cross on foot in the end I, I went through part of the the wood here and as you come through the wood uh, which obviously is private ground and, and has to be respected, you can see the signs of shell holes. There's no trenches in there, but you can see it's undulating ground, smashed ground, typical of, of what you'd expect the whole terrain here to have once looked like by the end of the uh, of the conflict. But eventually you come out of a little bit of the woods, the continuation of the track goes up ahead, and then you take a path off to your right, and that takes you down to the cemetery and the cemetery gate. As you go in here, you see that, that it is a small cemetery. There's 139 burials in Grand Ravine Cemetery, 11 of them unidentified, so the majority of the men are known. It's a battlefield cemetery, not from the 1917 operations, but from the fighting here in 1918 in the final battles over the Hindenburg Line. Row B of the cemetery was made by the 62nd West Riding Division burial officer, now, what was a burial officer? Well, by the last year of the war, every division had these, and their task was to take the team that they had to go across the battlefield, the battleground, following the advance of the troops, looking for the dead to make sure they were properly buried, to try and minimise uh, the huge number of missing or unidentified soldiers that had plagued the recovery of the dead in the earlier parts of the of the war. They weren't always successful in this, given the conditions on, on many battlefields. But um, here he created a essentially a comrade cemetery, a men from a specific unit, in this case the West Riding Division, buried side by side with row B from the fighting here in September of 1918 and rows A and C was made by the same burial officer in October of the same year. This being a, a comrade cemetery made up of men from the same division, we see the cat budges as we scan our eyes across the rows of graves here, reflecting the units within that division. So quite a lot of men from the King's Own Yorkshire Line Infantry, the West Riding Regiment, and also the York and Lanx. Now I first came to this cemetery in, in the mid-1980s with my father and a French friend of mine, Bernard, and he was born on the Combray battlefields uh, and lived on the Combray battlefields and very kindly took me around on my very first visit to this area. His father had been a farmer up at Guzalcor and he knew the grounds intimately. And he brought me to this cemetery because he wanted to show me a particular grave in here because the name on it for him as a Frenchman typified everything that was English. And when he mentioned this, I thought perhaps he meant it's going to be the grave of John Smith. But he brought me to the grave of Arthur Lancelot Lyon. And to him, Lancelot Lyon symbolised everything that was British. Lyon is spelled L-Y-O-N rather than L-I-O-N. Uh, 
But for him, Lancelot, with the whole sort of Arthurian legends, uh, that was a name that he associated with that, and lion with the lion and unicorn seen on many cap badges and official documents of the period. For Bernard, this young lad, this young 18-year-old lad from Preston, his name was typically English, typically British. And Bernard said that he would come here on many occasions to come and see this young man, to pay his respects to that generation of men from Britain and the Commonwealth who had come here to fight for France in the Great War. And this is typical uh, of the experience that you get when you talk to locals on the ground here. They have a great respect for these places, and in the months that we don't traditionally come to the Western Front, in the years when we can come, outside of our previous 12 months, what you do find is that the cemetery registers are full of French names of locals walking up for an afternoon stroll. And I would guess during these 12 months that we've just had, those long months of the pandemic when we couldn't get across to the battlefields, it would be people walking the ground around places like Havrincourt that would pop in to these cemeteries and pay their respects. They continued that remembrance for us. And I think it's important to think of that and acknowledge it. But I have another little connection to this cemetery with the grave of an unknown corporal of the York and Lancaster Regiment. When I was out in the 90s walking the ground on the Somme in preparation for writing my book, Walk in the Somme, I met many splendid fellow travellers who were also walking the ground at that time, and one of them was a chap called Roy Evans from Cheadle. Roy was following the story of his relative who'd served as a corporal with the York and Lanx and had been killed in the fighting here at Havering Corps in September of 1918. He had no known grave and was commemorated on the Visonartois Memorial. Roy had done a, a lot of research on the West Riding Division, and he was typical of many of, of the kind people that I've met throughout my interest in the Great War who were only too willing to share the results of the research that they'd done. And he provided me with a lot of information about Major General Braithwaite and the search for his son, which I subsequently used in Walking the Somme. When I moved to Corselette, Roy used to pop in and see me, and we came and had a good look at the grounds where his relative had fought in 1918, and we came here to Grand Ravine Cemetery because I knew that there were men from his relative's battalion who were buried here, and we found this unknown corporal's grave of the York and Lanx, and Roy adopted it, really, because it could be his relative, it could be someone else's, but for him it was his little beacon, his point that he came back to, every time he came to the Western Front. And he continued to do that for the rest of his life. A very kind, very gentle man, who I always think of when I come to this cemetery. So we'll leave these sleeping comrades behind and retrace our steps along the path and back to the track. We'll turn right and follow it uphill slightly and take another track off to the left. And a little bit further along that, we'll get a good viewpoint across this part of the battlefield. Ahead of us is the rising ground of the Fleskier Ridge, some of the most formidable defences on this part of the Hindenburg Line battlefields around Combray. And it was here on the 20th of November 1917, on the flank of the West Riding Division attack, that tanks went forward across this ridge to take that crest. And in November 1998, I witnessed the unearthing of one of those tanks all those decades after the Battle of Combray. But that's a tale for another day, for another journey along the old front line. You've been listening to an episode of The Old Front Line with me, military historian Paul Reed. You can follow me on Twitter at Somcor. You can follow the podcast at Old Front Line Pod. Check out the website at oldfrontline.co.uk where you'll find lots of podcast extras and photographs and links to books that are mentioned in the podcast. And if you feel like supporting us, you can go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash oldfrontline, or support us on Buy Me A Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash oldfrontline. Links to all of these are on our website. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again soon.